But um, yes, I've, thanks for inviting and thanks to Bassam for the invitation to do this discussion. Um, I just want to say I'm not an expert. I'm actually just very interested. And I guess this is one of these things of becoming a, an academic or a sort of a you know, learning and you know, working clinically and trying to put the two together is that you just observe things. You know, after 30 years observation, we've sort of seen more and more variation in what's going on with sports and again working with entertainment and performers, you know, this thing about movement and how well do they move. So motor control has become very, in, very much in focus the last five, ten years. Everyone's talking about, oh, get better motor control. Yes, they're strong, but they should be better controlled. So today I want to look at it and say, well, we've talked about it a lot. Can we actually do something about it? And that's the big thing, saying we've seen it. What does it mean? How are we going to use it? So let's get moving. And I guess the whole thing of this motor control training, it's sort of a bit airy-fairy. You know, we see athletes that move extremely well. Then we see ones that don't. You know, you watch the Federers, you, the Agassiz, the Sampras's. They move well. They make it Djokovic. They make it look easy. But then you get the guys who work really hard and they get injured. Roddick. Nadal's very good or he's injured. There's a difference. These guys move differently. And we see this plan out in the length of their careers and also in their injury rates. So the thing is, if we're training, how do we match the deficits in these individual athletes? Are they all doing the same thing? Should we be doing the same thing or treat them individually? So the focus on strength training, increasing performance or increasing injuries. I'm going to put it out there and go, yes. Ever seen strength training programs increase along with the injury rate or vice versa? Time after time, we hear this combination, this thing. And then also the motor control beyond conscious recruitment, you know, thinking about your movement. You don't actually think about it, it happens. So this is another thing of saying, are we using the right training tools? So I guess that's why we're here, isn't it? Exercise is becoming, if it hasn't already become, the cornerstone of medicine. Exercise in medicine, very important. We're seeing it. Cardiac, diabetes, obesity, everything involves, yes, let's do some exercise. But that scares people because some exercise is good, some makes them very nervous. Now, I wasn't going to mention this. Sorry. But we made it easy. Whoa, yeah. Who, who's the Scot I just heard? Sorry. It was close, wasn't it? <laughs> you robbed. <laughs> and uh, we just made it easy for New Zealand, which, you know, we won. Let's face it, you know. After all, New Zealand's a small island off the coast of Australia somewhere. Um, yeah, the New Zealanders see it differently. But, um, you know, we had to give them something because, you know, if you've got irritable bowel, it's a bit nasty. We're, we're better off on the irritable bowel state. I mean, I don't know what that's got to do with the discussion, but I was trying to put it into perspective. Um, anyway, where were we? I won't mention it again, I promise. Hopefully. So, this balance between the two, motor control versus strength. And if you get the two right, they're strong guys and get them moving better. Are they going to have less injuries? That's the hope. So we're going to look at this novel model I've been working on, working with a research team, to see can the strength training coexist to get better injury resistant athletes? Can we do the two? So we're going to start and pick on the old chestnut. And with all the injuries that get people going out there, what is it, hamstrings and ACLs, let's face it. Anybody here work in sporting teams? What's the one that annoys you the most? It's got to be the ACL, isn't it? We fixed it and it broke again. It must be all right, we fixed it, but then it broke again. And the recurrence rate is, hasn't, you know, in the last 25, 30 years watching this, you know, we go back to the Kevlar carbon fibre Gore-Tex grafts in the 80s, and they were going to be the next best thing with these rock solid knees, they all rotted out. We had half the AFL in Australia running around with ACL deficient knees, quite happily. So what's the problem? Is it the ACL? So we're going to pick on this one because it helps focus the conversation. And what happens? They mostly just fall over. It's not a case of they get the big hits. Yeah, a few big hits, but the majority of them, and I will show a few rugby players, just falling over. Nothing happened. There was a thing went out a few weeks ago about the injury rate. Oh, I wasn't going to mention it, was I? Sorry. About the injury rate. And everyone said, oh, it's the big hits, they're all bigger. But this is one of your blokes, I believe. And he said, it's not the big hits, it's the pulls and twists, the little stuff, the innocuous stuff. The what the hell was that stuff that occurs? And you know, it's only, what, a couple of weeks ago now. 
So what is this? Motor control, people talk about it. It's the neuromuscular system getting you moving, the motor skill, and then your motor learning. And when you take that apart a little bit, the control factor is this and the reacquiring of skills lost through injury or disease. And that's what we deal with. We're dealing with injury or is there a disease? But there's something going on in the background. Have we fixed the problem before we try to fix the symptom, i.e. you put in a new CL, new ACL, but you haven't fixed the reason why it occurred. Putting new cars, new tyres on a car with bad suspension isn't going to fix the problem. So we're going to have to dig into it a little bit further. Explicit versus implicit. And explicit means they're consciously trying to control it. It's too slow. In fact, it's detrimental. It's going backwards. It's like trying to think about which muscles are working when you're driving a car. Oh, I'm trying to dorsiflex as I change gear. Oh, should I just hit a pedestrian, you know? It's distracting you from the task. This is what we're going to be after. The implicit movement effect, not consciously trying to control movement. Federer doesn't sit there and think about which muscles he's using. He's focusing on the task at hand. So we're going to task orientate this. Now, collective groan, I heard you. I'm not going to talk about brains. It's overrated, actually. Do you know that, the brain? I wouldn't want to get through life without one, but um, we focus too much on this thing. You know, back in Australia, there's a big focus on brain activity and brain thing, and if you want to upset them, talk about them brain and say it's too slow. It's great for certain things, but when it comes down to movement and function, it's too far away. So we've got to be dealing with something else. You're saved. No brain discussion, I promise. Now, Bernstein, back in the 60s, a Russian physiologist, talked about coordination, which is the motor control, how many degrees of free are you going to need, to control this and reducing the number of independent variables to be controlled. There's a lot going on when you move. There's a lot going on when you start doing a task. 792 muscles, give or take. I'll just take that on, as in, on advice. But to move that, you want regularity without regulation. It can't come from up here. We want regular movement, not discoordinated movement. And again, patterned outputs from unpatterned inputs. Does that make sense? Of course it does. You know, there's garbage in, garbage out. That's the other one. You know, and this is part of the problem. We give them the wrong thing and expect a good outcome. It's the version of insanity. So if we start looking at poor old ACLs, as I said before, most of them are non-contact, don't they? People just get up and fall over. They run and twist and go, what happened? Another ACL trauma. It's quick, minus 70, less than 73 milliseconds. And your spinal reflex is 128 milliseconds. This is the problem. 40 millisecond lag. Could you control a 40, second, 40 millisecond lag from here? I doubt it. You can't. It's too far away. So this is the problem. It's all happening at the local level. And by the time you know it's happening, you're on the ground holding your knee. So it's this, the latency of this response. It's too slow. It doesn't get there. And of course, that's the system at fault. It's not the ligament. It's not the structure. We got any surgeons in the room? We always have fun with this one because we fix the structure, it should be fine. But they don't. So where is the problem? It's not at the structural level. It's beyond that. Let's have a little look at some videos. You ready, Mr. Music? Excellent. You can spend hours on YouTube. But have a look at this chap. He's going to run out the wing. Here he is. Watch this. And something happened. Now, watch this in slow motion. Observation time. As he's running, watch this left leg. He's got a flail leg before he hits the ground. Oh, that hurt, didn't it? <laughs> Just pull that back again and have another look. Go back to the middle there. Yeah, about there, that'll do us. Watch this left leg. It's all shut down. He doesn't really hit the ball. So where's the problem? It's the whole limb. It's not, oh, his hips broken, his knee's gone, his ankle's gone. You've got this transient neuropraxic moment. The thing is shut down and ouch. But it's not like he's tripped on the ball. The ball doesn't really deviate. All right, let's have a go at the next one. If you're a little bit delicate, you can look away, but this one's... Off we go.
What's this bloke here? You know, it's all working well. And then, oop, oh, we're getting a bit wonky. Something's not right, something's not right. And then he has a moment. And just in case you didn't see it the first time, let's do it again. <laughs> and if you didn't see it the first and second time, we'll do it again. <laughs> Ouch. He didn't cry though. He's very good. But it's not broken. I mean, there's nothing poking out there. There's no pus. There's no blood, you know. He's standing on it. But what happened? And if you look at this, he then goes into this asymmetrical movement. Everything's running smoothly, and then the system just says, Oh, look, I've had enough. I'm out of here. Here's muscle. This is latency. Ouch. And then he hurts his knee. So if you actually go back, the events occurred before the event. There's something happened. The coordination's gone. The system is not firing properly. Afferent, afferent's not doing what it should do. It sort of goes, whoops, we're a bit out of whack here. And the system then can't take the force being put through it. We could be here all day. Get onto YouTube one night and look up sporting injuries. You've seen the kickboxer who takes the kick and fractures his tibia? Oh, it's good. And he steps back. It's like, anyway, sorry. So... What are we going to look at? If we go into ACLs, we can look at this restoration of mechanical stability by giving them a reconstruction. Very popular. Off you go. But post-surgically, we know massive variation in outcomes. You know, less than 50% return to sport in the first year. Large re-rupture rate, greater than 25%. And this is the problem. Movement asymmetries persist. They can still be functioning. They can have strength and all the rest of it, but they don't move well. The problem that started it persists. You can have great quads, hamstring. Remember the days of Cybex? Anybody here know what a Cybex is? Who doesn't know what a Cybex is? The young people. <laughs> Biex, Medex, Kingcom. They don't teach it at uni any day. I mention it in lectures now and they sort of look at you. What's a Cybex, Granddad? Oh. Yeah, good on you. Um, and it's this abnormal trunk and lower limb movements, not only predict the first knee injury, but also the re-injury risk. And this is the thing we're missing, this bad movement pattern. Oh, structure's fixed, but. And if we then start looking at the outcomes, longer term, we now know this, oh, you've got to have an ACL, otherwise you've got OA knee. Doesn't happen. 15 years post-surgically, there's no evidence of OA knees. And the same here, at five year follow-up between early delayed and no surgery, no difference. No difference in your pain, ADL function, sport and recreation function, knee related quality of life, and so forth. So this urgency to go and get it done, we're seeing ACL deficient knees functioning beautifully. So what's going on? Big studies still coming out, 500, 67 hadn't returned to sport, 12 months. And follow up, the 5,700 with a RICO, 41, 63% had returned and only 44 to competitive sports. So we're not seeing the 100%. Big dropout rate. Not many businesses that would cope with that sort of lack of performance. But this is the big one here. Patients with a good hop test and IE, less than 15% variation between sides, seem to do better. The ones where their hop test Shows a variation greater than 15%, 20%, don't do as well. One leg's not as good as the other. So where does that leave us? Sloppy trunks. The whole body's involved. It's not just the knee. It's not between there and there. The whole system is involved. We look at our runner. That whole mass accelerating wasn't the knee. It was the whole mass being taken by one joint, ultimately. So that and a combination of other things going on. And this is also the other thing. Is it just one structure? Or have we got a list of problems going on? That's probably our little thing we're going to have a look at. I wasn't going to show this, was I? Let's hit it. <laughs> this is one of ours, by the way. We'll show you one of ours, then we'll show you one of yours. There he is, Dave Pocock. Now, have a look at it. Oh, it just missed the beginning of it. Have a watch. Here he is here. Coming around in slow motion. Nobody's near him. He's just ruptured his cruciate there. And then, of course, by the time he knows about it, down he goes and bang. What happened? Yeah, you know, he's 
twisted. He, his foot's not getting stuck. Nobody hit him. There's no contact. Sorry, here's one of yours. Lee Halfpenny. Nobody near him. This was before the cup, wasn't it? You're against the friendly against Italy. The Welsh man's looking sad. But have a look there. Nothing happened. And we can go through this hour after hour of video of the same thing time and time again of these non-contact just falling over. Something's happened to the system and it breaks. I'll go back to one of ours. So here's Dave Pocock in a moon boot. But Dave Pocock's had problems with his knee and he's had problems with his ankle. Then we nearly had him out of the final because he had problems with his calf. He's also had problems with his shoulder. You ever see this in patients? Tell me you haven't had a patient tell you, mate, it's all on one side. Within the first 30 seconds, within a minute, oh, I've got my knee on my ankle and my bum and my back and my shoulder and my ear. This one-sidedness thing. And is this the elephant in the room? You know, this was earlier in the year. His left ankle played up. And he's had a knee problem. He's had two ACLs on that knee, so I'm sure the third ACL is going to last a long time. Or is there something else going on with the system that allows it to break consistently? Now, we'll play this one. Now, there's no crowd here, so it's, he's not acting. There he goes. Typical footballer. Just falls down. But the same thing here. He's getting there. He's thinking about it. But watch the event. Same story, left leg in the back, hits the ground, goes over, no contact, and it's gone again. That was his second one. Got one of Michael Owen, we can go on, you know, people just falling over. There it is. So, is this our problem? And this has just come out in the last month. You know, we're focusing on structure, continuing to focus on structure, looking at the structure and getting distracted by everything else that's going on around the structure. If we go and look at tendinopathies, they're very popular at the moment, but they still don't know what a tendinopathy is, let alone what to do about it. They still can't agree on proper loading processes. We've got a few Australians who are very focused on tendinopathy at the moment, but they're starting to go, we actually really don't know what's going on. How do we actually get these things beyond a certain point? Shoulders. Anybody here love all the shoulder tests? How many of those have been proven valid? Do you know why Brian wants his name taken off, the, off his test? Chad Cook took him to task on it and said, mate, it doesn't cut it, it doesn't work. Rule number one, never put your name to a test that hasn't been validated. But someone's going to come along and tell you it's not testing the structure. So every time we look at these structural tests, we're getting more confusion and more convergence than divergence, some more divergence than convergence. So, ultimately, we've got a job ahead of us. All right. What the hell was that about? <laughs> Anyone to work on the ninth floor? Yeah, you walk out, yeah. is that on every other floor or just the ninth floor? <laughs> and the 14th floor. Obviously, sport and art go together. So. What I'm going to do is introduce a little bit of culture to this group. I was told they could cope. So we're going to go and move. A little bit of culture. All right, let's just hit the button.
Does he twist? Does he turn? Lots. Very few ACL injuries in dancers. So the secret there is obviously you have a couple of drinks on stage and that's going to sort it all out every single time. But if we start looking and saying, well, is it the twisting? Is it the turning? Is it the jumping in tight spaces? There we have one. But if we actually look at the instance of ACLs in dancers, very few. This study came out a few years ago and looking at 298 dancers, 12 ACL injuries over a five year period. In fact, I've still got colleagues in the dance world, the Royal Ballet. Your own Royal Ballet Company, in the last 13 years, the instance of ACL injuries, three. Three ACLs in the Royal Ballet in a 13 year period. New York City Ballet, 10 year period, none. What's going on? So, multi-million dollar problem, and here are people who play five, eight games a week sometimes, performing, hardly ever hurting themselves. You compare this to, and getting this per thousand exposure statistic, trying to find something similar, Johnny Orchard's work, we found something here, but a big difference at the frequency. So, what do we got? This thing about looking at balance, looking at Stability, postural stability, there's some work out. Postural stability doesn't differ. And they were looking at this balance, well, balance excursion scoring system, evaluation, balance evaluation scoring system, and seeing does static balance vary between the dancers and sports people. And this was looking at the two and found there was really no difference on static or quasi static balance. So we can rule that one out. Starting to train coordination by getting people to balance doesn't actually differ between the people who have high incidence verging very low incidence. So it doesn't explain that. So the movement ongoing looking at the more the dynamic balance and limb asymmetries. So looking here again also looking at resistance to fatigue. People talk about it's fatigue. A lot of these games happen very early. I think it was Michael Owen in the World Cup how many years ago? He was like two minutes into the game. Did his ACL. These things don't happen late in the game necessarily. So doing single leg drop landings, comparing dancers and looking between athletes and dancers, they took longer to reach fatigue than the athletes. 30 centimetre drop, male female athletes versus male female dancers. The female athletes had the greatest knee valgus on landing, the male dancers had the least. They had the best control just on landing. So combination of that and better overall stability, control. So if we go back to this discussion before, we're looking for this automatic implicit focus, working on that to start getting this function back. And we don't have time, do we? You know, we can do a thousand things and where do you get hardly at all? I'm getting old and I'm getting grumpy. I want to get it done now. I've got better things to do. So we're going to look at this quick. Let's go back to po Dave Pocock. So he's had two cruciates. Do you think he's going to have it again? What are your chances? You're nodding knowingly. I love it. <laughs> and we see it. Is it structure or is it an impairment on this left-hand side that is really going to cause Now, if we look at cricketers, this is one of ours, Shane Watson. You may have heard of him. He's either very, actually he's just retired, but he's either very good or he's broken. And this was in the newspaper, but if you pull up his body chart and have a look at him. It's doing it again, Mum. So if he's going to have a hamstring injury, just take a rough guess, wild guess. What do you reckon, left or right? Well done, how did you know? You must be a genius. <laughs> and this is it. I've had that confirmed by the cricket boys. Oh, he had a little bit of a left calf strain at one stage. Poor thing but every other bloody injury is on the same side as every other bloody injury. And this is what we see as clinicians. It's happening time and time again. So as clinicians we know, acutely you're going to manage a structure, micromanagement, and we know that over a four to six, 12 week period, the tissue will histopathologically repair itself and we're on our way again. But it's these ones, you know, the chronic, the recurrent, so we're going to stand back, you know, the chronic hamstring, the recurrent knee issue. We're going to stand back and macro manage. Look at the big picture and look at the system, not just the structure. Regionally dependence, 
What does that mean? We'll explain that in a moment. And again, let's find out what's going behind the structural problem, not just keep on looking at the structure. It's a definition of insanity, isn't it? Doing the same thing over and over, trying to expect a different outcome. And we are insane. We're doing it. So let's look at the whole picture. What is regional interdependence? A concept that seemingly unrelated impairments in a remote anatomical region may contribute or be associated with a patient's primary complaint. We do look at this. We should be looking at this. And again, move away to impairment base. The move from structure is getting stronger. As I said before, looking at shoulder tests, looking at these structural tests, we're not seeing good outcomes being able to say, yes, we can definitively identify that structure as the primary cause. There's something else behind it. We're getting too complex. And if it works for Apple, it's on the main wall at Cupertino. We can do the same thing. We can make it simpler. We're making it more complex and we're not helping ourselves. So I'm going to use Occam's razor. Bit of history here. He was a 14th century Benedictine monk, but he was a philosopher. And it's the basis of science, the simplest method. You know, we talk about minimising variables, don't we, in research. The more variables, what have you got? Less control. The less you do, the more you know. And it starts from the 14th century. The two theories both explain the facts, use the simplest, until better came along. Again, scientific rigour, logic, etc. You know, to defend a conclusion. But you make the quick decision. We do it daily, time and time. The rule of thumb, the heuristics. I'm going to try this. Purilitus non esponenda sine necessitate. Was that all right? My Latin? Don't do that. Don't introduce too many variables. Or well, the Australian version, vitare questus sepultus est in excremento impertinence. Don't get buried in bullshit. That actually rolled off the tongue much easier, didn't it? But that's what we do. We get that and we forget this. Let's do what Einstein did. Simple as possible. All right. Let's get on to the guts of this thing. Now, we're going to look at some studies that we've done over the years, just putting this to test. We did this with some of the Liverpool boys starting about seven, eight years ago. And it was looking at performance. How high can you jump and land? Using a little measure here, measuring time in the air, flight time. Pre-intervention, we picked on a lot of players had problems on one side, surprisingly. Go through a whole team. Good on the left, bad on the right. Which side do you think his injuries were on? Right. Well done. You are a genius. <laughs> and then doing a regime that matched a subgrouping model. We're going to call this a matched bias. Um, a matched bias. So doing something that matches a subgrouping process. Repeat the same test. Is there an improvement in performance? Answer, yes. On a validated performance tool, better flight time, both sides. Then go and do the wrong thing on purpose, which we're doing unknowingly constantly with our athletes. Do the wrong thing on purpose, we buggered him up. And the rule was, mate, if you're going to mess him up, make sure you can fix him again. Right? But we knew then going back to doing what we'd done at this point, we could improve yet again. So what is this? The first thing of this is, is we're not looking at long time frames. We're not looking at two, four, six weeks. This is within subject, within session. Being able to change performance within a matter of moments. So the idea of doing correct, incorrect, then correct again and measuring the outcome. There's a predictor in place here and putting this predictor into a subgroup. Now, we'll talk about this as we go along, but it's looking at exercise. We do exercise all the time. We do our rehab exercise, etc. The big problem we're doing with rehab is we're doing everything, both sides, both directions. In fact, there's a simpler model out there which has level one evidence behind it, that in fact, if you do things, that's flexion, that's extension, that's to the right, that's to the left. If you do things on one side, in one direction, you will better get a better outcome. And that was the basis of this pilot study. This is one side, one direction. That's the wrong side in the wrong direction. 
and that's the correct side in the correct direction. We can measure changes. So we've been doing this with dancers for years. who are very compliant, God love them, but trying it on the footballers as well and getting the same results. So we put this to the test and published this through Otago University, looking at the prediction model, firstly, to see if it's reliable. So myself and the primary researcher looked at classification. Could we classify a group of people with past history of injuries, no current acute, subacute problems, into one of these four quadrants? Extension left, extension right, flexion left, flexion right. Good kappa, 0.75. So the study was allowed to continue. So the next bit of this was to look at, like, can we replicate similarly what we'd done with the football study, but this time introduce the idea of stability. Now, when you start looking for stability, everyone talks about stability work. It's overrated, and it's very difficult if you're looking at dynamic. Static, oh yeah, how long can you hold a plank, which is not a measure of stability. But landing here on a forced platform, how high in the air, and then contact time. And this has been validated by Ross, looking at functional ankle instability, and it measured ground reaction force landing on the force platform. So if you land in perturbation, it takes quite a while to get stable, that's poor. If you jump, land and go blah, 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 much quicker, response, that's a better time to stabilisation. So therefore, you've got better control. Simple little study, hang with me. Two groups. Your baseline test of measuring hop, how long, and then what happened when you landed, so it's flight time, and then also time to stability being AP mediolateral. So it's just measuring how much do you wobble backwards and forwards, how much do you wobble side to side. So a baseline was taken. First group were given four exercises, matching their subgroup at retest. The predictor was from this one to this one, doing the correct thing, they'd be better. And they were. Same group. Crossover. Same group doing the wrong thing on purpose, the predictor being at this point they'd be poorer, and they were. They then did the same thing, different sequence, baseline test, did the wrong thing, they got worse, did the correct thing, they got better. So a nice little two by two study, easily replicable, and we have replicated this in numerous different varieties, of the effect of doing incorrect and correct on a validated dynamic stability tool. Nice, tidy. So if we look at exercises, what's a left extension biased exercise look like? Lying on your tummy, legs to the left, move the one leg. This exercise, which we see all the time, on all fours moving one leg. The problem is, don't do it both sides. You'll stuff them up. You do one side. You stabilise on one side and you move one side. You stabilise on the good side and move the problem side. This is going to upset people. If you try and train them to stabilise on the problem, they actually do deteriorate. Actually, can we play these two videos down here? So again, if we look at movement, this is in relative extension, the system is extension, and this is left. So we're not going to do this on both sides. Just try the other one as well. So an exercise such as this, the system is maintaining overall extension, disassociating flexion, but maintaining extended position. So that would fit in this bottom part of the quadrant. This one here, particularly just one side, one side would be the left. The opposite of that would be right flexion. So if a person's matched bias was the previous one, this is the thing that would stuff them up, doing the direct opposite. Inflection, inflection. Let's have a crack at these two. So this exercise is also inflection. And yep, that's also inflection. But this again is subgrouping. This subgrouping specificity does have validity. So taking us on to this. Outcome of this was basically the match bias would show immediate improvement from baseline, that was predicted, and the immediate degradation from baseline if you did the incorrect thing. End of the day, we can say we can predict the outcome of different inputs, and this is a tool we're looking for. You know, Predictors of injury, predictors of outcome is gold. 
So it's been validated. So examples of this. Let's have a little look. Can we just do the left-sided video? Give that a click. Are in pre-intervention. Stand on one leg. Good. Now do five squats. Go one, two, three, four, five. Feet Don't together. So get a stable. Yeah. <laughs> Stand on the right leg. That's better. Do five squats. Go. You're suspicious one, she has a problem on one side. Two, My grandmother three, can see that one. Four, five, we'll be going through this in the blood. workshop in more Stand detail. Leg, but this again, chronic rises, problem. Rise up on your toes. Being treated at a structural one, level two years two, later, three, still having problems. Three, four, five, so we're losing left, simple tests. Right leg, Dead go, simple one, tests. Two, three, four. Five. Would you be happy to hop on and that And we'll do one leg? more test. Okay, off you go. Do five hops. Go one, two, three, four, five. Are okay you suspicious? Right one, You'd be right. Two, three. So she doesn't four, function terribly five. well. I guess the answer is not as Going good. through the history, the history sort of highlighted the fact that the trauma was predominantly flexion. The problem was obviously right side. So the focus of the treatment was towards the one side in one direction. To the right side, staying away from flexion, and then re-record. Same patient, give it a go. Post. post same patient. Post-intervention. So it's the same day. Two, same patient. Three, post-intervention. So we're not dealing with structure here. Four, we're not dealing with neural damage, we're dealing with neural impairment. This is neural drive. We'll touch on that briefly as we go along. But this is not also not cortically mediated either. So she's not thinking about the movement. This is happening subcortically. And this day of measurement, that can be measured, can't it? So if she was worth a few dollars, we've got something. Can we put this one back onto plate? Do they need surgery? If that was a surgical, and this was a surgical candidate, they were thinking maybe the hip's the problem, we'll do a label repair. We've just negated that. In fact, there's a 37% change in function within session. Uh, conservative candidate, right there. Quick and dirty test. So. We'll run this one through too. And the clinical translation of these is actually doing it and taking measures. Can we just run the left hand video? The same simple tests and then putting measures against them. So on her right leg, scoring herself, patient specific functional scale, self reporting. Not as happy on the left leg. Scores herself a three out of five on the right, one and a half on the left. Scores herself a two and a half there. Heavier, poorer control. Not as good, scores herself one and a half there. Doing a hop. And no. Nah. So this is a month, uh, sorry, a year post ACL repair. Guess which leg? It's left. <laughs> He's thinking about it. So the question being, well, can we apply this same model in this sort of situation? You know, a year later, done all the rehab. Why isn't it working? Let's go impairment based. And can we hit? Actually, can we probably play both them together? Hit that one and play the other one. So post-intervention, we'll put the pre-intervention one there. Same day, same patient, same hairstyle, same venue. Let's have a look at the post-intervention. The intervention has been to the left in extension. Doesn't matter what the intervention has been. Can we predict the outcome? Much smoother, more confident movement than this. Much more rigid, slower, much more elastic and fluid. And 
the left, hop now starts coming in. So what have we done? Well, what we've done can be measured. So post-intervention, she scored herself better on the squat, better on the heel raise, and then better on the hop. But if we look here at function, on the left-hand side particularly, even a good side improved by 10%, which is just on minimal detectable change. But we've got a 23, 26% change in function on that left leg. Have we got something to deal with? So here's where we start saying we can reproduce this consistently. So that was the intervention that made the difference. That was her subgroup, gave her exercises matching this left extension bias. That was it. Not both sides, not strength orientated, looking much more just at impairment and we're able to rec record and predict it. This study we haven't published yet. This is out of Targa University. So the thing of proprioception, the importance of proprioception in motor control has been a, is the big one. This was taking six papers and looking at different variables of exercises performed, the time frame, two to four to six weeks, the measure, postural sway, centre of pressure, star excursion balance, and the percentage change in proprioception. Some of these go backwards. Some do improve nicely, it takes four weeks. As I said, we haven't published this yet, but consistently be able to get 26.9% change in proprioception within 16 minutes. That's the game changer. So if we can do this consistently, we're trying to work out how to publish this one just yet. So it's sitting there, ready to go. So more, we've got more measures coming along. Again, I'll just pass over this quickly, but there's more ver variable measuring tools out there. This is a process called Dorsey V, which measures valgus, varus. I won't go into it in great detail, but looking also at tibial inclination and speed. The short story from this being pre-intervention, if we can measure various valgus, you know, 40 degree variation pre-intervention, post-intervention, 14. And again, it's that control of lateral movement that is said to be the problem. If we can make this smaller and then measure, that's faster versus that. Then looking also at the hop, without spending too much time on graphs. People go crazy when you show them graphs. But again, your 103 degrees down to 72 degrees is good. That's what you need to know. <laughs> the rest of it we're learning about very rapidly. But again, using very complex, you know, high-tech tools, fabulous. But just seeing the change in variability, here there wasn't much change. But the thing is, it's a much faster response where well, this took longer to respond. And that's it. The longer it takes to respond, that's when it's all over. So this is happening at the subcortical level. So our current process, this is one of my colleagues, Sam Leslie, has just taken, undertaken a PhD on this. We're working through a pilot process at the moment, but to see if we can translate this directional bias model into strength and conditioning. So to satisfy the sporting world, how much is enough? You know, at what point does it peak? And then we find it goes over the top and drops off the other side. So there's a sweet spot in here somewhere. So this pilot study initially was looking at two groups to see a matched bias versus unmatched bias program, establishing baseline, four weeks of strength training, then four weeks of power training, looking at the standards that will be done with strength and conditioning in your athletes. Two groups, the matched group, 21 people in the standard non-matched group. Each of these athletes were assessed beforehand to see if they did fit into this directional bias criteria and that was the inclusion for the study. And of course, most of them do. We're finding you know, about 80% of your people do have this prevalence for a directional bias. This is a flexion orientated exercise, by the way, in case you were wondering, under load. So the measures, we're looking at 20 meter sprint, pro agility test, hop for distance and rebound hop of three and vertical repetitions, three and eight repetitions. So if you look at the eight vertical hops, which is similar to what we did before, you know, we did five, this is doing eight. Looking at the control group, the unmatched group, baseline test there, after the strength training of four weeks, they got a 0.9% improvement. The intervention group matching their bias, 12.4% improvement. The post power, and this is where it's interesting, then the power training went backwards. These continue to go forwards, 18.1%. So this starts to add meat to the bone saying, do we have a problem? And this is on their good leg. 
On the problem leg, same thing occurring here, your baseline, post strength, they get worse, they get better. They've gotten worse, they've gotten better. So this is now putting some statistics against it to go, there is a point at which doing the strength training without this directional bias is showing deterioration in measures. Very important. Next set of this, looking at the three hop for distance, just, everyone, I'm not going to do it for you. <laughs> Anyone want to volunteer? Um, same thing here, the non-biased leg, the good side. Both sides improved, but there's a difference in the improvement. And the biased leg, there's a greater variable in improvement there. That's the simple thing. Pro agility test. Again, this is one of the things looking for the significance. 2.5 to 7% improvement. So if you're looking at strength training, now this would be an example of a right extension biased exercise. Weight bearing on the good leg, the right leg as they do the squat will be into extension on the right. So we can change these programs to fit in by doing less. 20 metre sprint, not much difference. So this is the straight line stuff. Not much agility involved for cutting, turning, twisting in a straight line. And as he was suggesting, no, we're not going to see much and that's not significant, 0.44. So at the end of the day, where we're at at this point, as I said, this has just been finished off. The directionally specific group were better in agility and better in the eight repeated vertical hop tests. And this is the important thing, because the agility is the cutting, the turning, the twisting, the side to side. There's the agility and there's the T agility. This was just the agility test. And then also the eight, which is looking more at endurance. No significant difference in the straight mead 20, 20 metre sprint speed. And again, you know, there's not many events out there that have only got 20 metres. Now looking at over 100 metres, 200 metres, that'll be a different story. And again, the shorter reps, hop for distance and vertical hop, testing on both sides. So he's getting something. So ultimately, which is better? The flexion programs or the extension programs? Ten, ten tend to be that these flexion programs were getting better. That's extreme flexion. But this was, whoops, coming out of the back of this, looking at your unbiased group, your standard training groups, your flexion group showed a little bit. This was looking at flight contact time, so we won't go into EMMs at the moment. But the extension group actually deteriorating. The more power, and this is the problem where you find a lot of these strength and conditioning programs have got extension loading in them, vertical compression extension loading. And here we're seeing deterioration in performance. The match bias group, the extension group got better, but this flexion group blew us out of the water. Performance was much better in the biased flexion group. So this comes down to, are we seeing this could be a selection criteria for athletic performance? We'll let you know. We're actually doing some of this with the English Institute of Sport, um, putting this into the screening protocols to test it. So. We're looking forward to see how this does work. So the short story is, we don't have to think about it. This is implicit stuff. This is no conscious cortical recruitment. This is coming from the subcortical process. So to finish off, we're going to talk about decerebrate cats. We've seen these videos, for, it's very hard to get them these days. I think the animal rights people got involved. But um, a decerebrate cat basically has no cortical control over this. But again, it's looking at rhythmical movement operating from a spinal reflex level and responding to external task. You've got rhythmical movement, it's not falling all over the place, flapping all over the place, you're getting rhythmical patterned movement. So what are we actually doing with this process? What do we think we're actually doing? We know it's not coming from here, but without getting too complex and going into spinal neuropathophysiology at the moment, as I said, the brain is overrated. It happens down here. The central pattern generator process basically drives out to the muscles, to the environment, feeds back into the system here, reflex feeds back into there. It's driven from here. There's a needs to know basis goes up to the higher cortex. It can have some effect going downstream, but is not the primary driver. So this being, there, is, there are models out there and this does feedback. We're talking with the neuro people on this side of it. 
And these central pattern generators are the rhythm generators. There's a left and there's a right. How convenient. <laughs> but without going to half center oscillators, they actually don't work by themselves. They work reciprocally. And this is the changing of phone. And we saw it before. We go back to our runner. Everything was working nicely. And then you start to get this asymmetry occurring. Are we getting a shift in the pattern to one side? And then there's a neuropraxic change on the opposite side. And this consistently produces poor movement, the limb asymmetry. We can get more complex if we want to, but we won't. Bottom story, it goes between these two, feeds down, feeding down into a central regulator that keeps it, and ideally, this is what we're wanting to do, then feeding out into the periphery. So, in conclusion, we're going to have to change the way we do things. Advertising world's changed a little bit, hasn't it? Can you imagine getting away with this? <laughs> But in 50 years' time, we don't want to see people... Are we still going to see people doing arthroscopies? We know about arthroscopies on the knees, don't we? The effect of arthroscopies on knees, ultimately, they don't provide good outcomes. You know, we're going to look at ACLs the same way. In 50 years' time, God, what were we thinking? What were they thinking? <laughs> Got some better ones than that, too. <laughs> but I'm going to leave you with this one. I could just hit this. So this is real time. Look at the effect of the wrong direction on somebody. This is a physio, but showing this is extension to the left. So she's got a left-sided problem, but this is actually doing the wrong thing. She volunteered. They'd already done it to herself. Then have a look at the effect of this on a jump. You'd be happy putting her out in the field, wouldn't you? And that was a good leg. <laughs> so I said, right, let's not do that again. We're going to change one variable here. We're now putting her into flexion to the left. We've incorporated rotation into this. It doesn't matter. She's now in relative flexion. Has the system changed? We're also having a little look there at range of motion just for a bit of a giggle. So the next step of this is take it into more flexion just to the left. Again, flexion to one side. What is the effect then of this on motor output? <laughs> so we know we're not dealing at the muscular level. We know we're not dealing at the cortical level. We do know we're dealing at the neural level. We can bring in models of neurocompression. But something happened there, better range. But more interestingly, A bit scary, isn't it? <laughs> and if you want to bugger her up, go and do guess what? And that was it. She'd already done this. And of course, a group of physios are going, oh, look at this one, we broke her. <laughs> Check my insurance. Um, but this is what we're finding. This quick replication, changing this neural output, changing neural drive. So we're looking at EMG activity with this. We're also going into intrafascicular pressure, neural measures. If you want to get technical, but the nice thing is we can do this at the clinic. We can do it at the coalface. And let's face it, I don't know. We just don't have time. That's it. Yeah, that was it. Thank you. <laughs>